Imagine thinking the Atlantic and the North Sea were the same thing. What a read. <laughs> All joined together. It's based anyway. Shut shut the fuck up. Rob, you're not dead. That's that's good. It's a start. <laughs> Congrats on not dying of the Rona. It's almost like I was in the actual epicenter in Scotland. <laughs> Wait. Help. I'm only gonna call this Royal Space Force because that's what Gainax actually wanted to call it. We'll get into that. But to give it its full title, it is Royal Space Force, the Wings of Honames. I believe I'm saying that right. Robert, please tell us a little bit about the movie, what we have, I think you just watched it yesterday, didn't you? Uh, I've watched it many, 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 many years ago. I watched it when it got re-released on Blu-ray recently, and I've obviously watched it again so we can talk crap on it. Basically, we watch a space launch, there's some rape, and uh, that's about it. <laughs> what more do you need to know? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the thing that's in this movie because <laughs> why, why did your manga do this? <laughs> what did he mean by this? Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I have I have thoughts on that particular <laughs> scene, but we'll get on to that in a bit. Yeah, so uh, Royal Space Force is a very, very strange movie. It's essentially an alternate universe Earth kind of thing, yeah. where it all works very similar to the 1960s and 1950s of our world, but also it's completely different, and it focuses on the attempts of this kind of empire nation to build together a, like a spaceship launch from scratch, and the people doing it are the most scuffed motherfuckers in existence but they managed to do it anyway so it's a bit of an underdog tale this one will probably be a little bit different in terms of how i was wanting to approach it because honestly the amount i read about just the creation of this film it, it's been that was a fascinating we deep dive in and of itself it's a very interesting film because a lot of it is the what's the word i want to use i mean the origins of this movie is kind of the origins of gynax so yeah like this is the debut album is the word i'm looking for yeah th this it's, it's kind of a big deal because Gainax is kind of a big deal. It's like they made some of the most definitive TV shows and films of uh, modern anime. Like Corpse Princess <laughs> and He Is My Master <laughs> and other shows that we can't mention because people in the comments will be like, you need to review this. <laughs> and we're going to be like, no. If one more person asks me to do fucking Iron-Blooded Orphans, I'm going to jump out the window. Jesus Christ. Hey Dave, uh, we should definitely review Iron-Blooded Orphans. <laughs> it's not a very tall window. It'll be a really, really sad suicide attempt don't don't embarrass me like that guys fuck's sake isn't that just what your tomb tomb's gonna say <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> a really embarrassing suicide <laughs> this is one of those movies where there definitely are a lot of prevailing themes but honestly talking about the themes in this it kind of comes up more in the production in terms of what they were trying to do yeah rather it's the plot yeah it's the plot is kind of like it's merely framing to show off how good Gainax is if you watch this film for the plot you've already made a mistake <laughs> this is about watching cool animation sequences and it's about the them showing off how technically good they were compared to full-time studios, I think would be the word to put it. Because remember, these guys went from making, they make the opening for Daikon. Yeah, they did Daikon 3 and 4 opening. And then went on to do this. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> this is like, that guy with the glasses going on to direct a Marvel film. It's like, <laughs> what <laughs> have you how done? How did he do this? One, one interesting fact that I think tells you a lot about this project is that the original pitch for it, which was done in September 1980, it was an anime pitch that described the setting and the story, but never named the main characters. And that tells you a lot. So let's talk about the characters, because they're clearly really important. Uh, there's like three <laughs> that I can remember. Okay, this falls back to the old Red Lighter Media thing, right? Where you have to describe the character without using their job or the clothes they wear. <laughs> Go, Dave. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got, could we call him a protagonist? I, I have thoughts about that as well, but Shirotsu Ladat, we'll just call him Shiro. He's an asshole, which is why he joined the Space Force in the first place, because he doesn't want a real job. He just kind of wants to doss about and not really achieve anything. Then he meets a girl handing out like apocalyptic literature in the red light district of this city. As you do. As you do, called Raquini. She's in... <laughs> This is really hard. Yeah, it's great. I love it. It's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. So without those limitations, Requini is this weird kind of religious girl who Shiro's crushing on. It's not really a relationship that they have. It's weird and disturbing at points, but we'll, I, I, we'll, we'll get to that. Don't don't you worry. You don't normally see religious characters like portrayed in a very positive light in a lot of modern media, whereas Requini is this very quietly religious 
religious person and her religion is portrayed as this quite positive thing about her and it's something that Shiro seems to kind of admire about her later on as well and then there's like this amorphous cast of scientists and other astronauts within this world who are all they're all like side characters to explain things that they don't really advance plots or anything like that there's some cool scenes with them all together like the scenes where they're all out on the town and drinking together and stuff that that felt pretty well done that seems like something that a bunch of goofball soldiers would be getting up to when they're not on the job as it were but yeah th- this isn't really a movie about the characters this is more about the ideas that they're trying to convey and the animation We're going to turn away from actually talking about the movie itself because I think a big focus for me when I was researching this and what I really got into was like the actual way in which this project came together and how Royal Space Force was made because honestly that was pretty fascinating to read about and fuck you it's our channel we get to do what we want. Yay. So let's talk about how this movie was made. So production. This project appears to have come about from Hiroyuki Yamaga and also the main producer of of it, Toshio Okada, I think I'm saying that correct, being absolute bullshit merchants par excellence. It was also, just before we go any further in this, early 1987 is like the explosion of anime video, right? Not as in like production of anime itself, but as in home release videos, right? Bandai at the time. Here we go, boys! Can't wait to see how quickly this gets fucking copy striked. Was purely a game developer. It did not make any anime, okay? This is Bandai's first film. <laughs> <laughs> so not only are they bullshit merchants, they fucking like conned everyone. And conned <laughs> is the right word because yeah. fuck off, they did. <laughs> what, what you've got to remember is that when, when I say that this is the the film that made Gainax. Gainax did not exist prior to the inception of Royal Space Force. Gainax was created as a means of storing like the resources and like paying the guys working on Royal Space Force. So without this movie, Gainax would not exist. And this is where a lot of the guys who went on to like be the big names of, of Gainax really cut their teeth as well. Yeah, because like early Gainax was literally just a bunch of film students who were fucking about. Like they'd all worked on different different shows and they'd all come together through uh, Daikon. So for example, with Anno, he'd worked on, is it Nausicaa? He was one of the animators. I think that was his first big production that he, he did. Uh, he'd also done, I think he'd done something with Macross prior to this as well, but those were like his two credits at the time. This was very, very early Anno before he'd like kind of stepped into a writer and directorial role. He was just an animator, right? Not just an animator. He was a fucking fantastic animator. They started work on Daikon 3 and Daikon 4, which are these like opening animations for these conventions, which are filled with loads of fan service stuff. I think there's Star Wars, there's Godzilla. You can find them online. Yeah. And they are actually really impressive things. The first one, Daikon Daikon 3 is you can tell that this was put together by a bunch of animation students in a basement somewhere because it's not great but you also if you when you look at it through the lens of this was done by a bunch of guys on a shoestring budget in a basement somewhere it's pretty fucking cool and then daikon 4 is fucking fantastic actually they actually go back and revisit a bunch of the stuff that they did with the first little animation redo it with uh, obviously what they'd learned and, and with a, maybe a bit of a better budget and a better idea of how to do it and then they go on just to you know make it look even better with all of these references like there's superheroes popping up there's star wars there's gundam there's transformers it's... i think if I remember rightly there's the yamato there's the arcadia yeah they blow up the yamato and that's why like i reference for example the the guy with glasses don't get me wrong i'm not saying those stuff is good that's not what i'm meaning here but it's like that style of amateur film work being done by people who have a passion for the hobby. It's not necessarily the greatest animation you've ever seen, but it's like, that's neat. I'm impressed that they did that on like, fuck all budget, essentially. I think the difference between the guy with the glasses and Daikon film is that Daikon film, you can actually see- Talent? (laughs) Yeah, not to shit on people who like that guy with the glasses. But fuck you. (laughs) Also, by all accounts, there's some shady fucking shenanigans going on with those guys, but this isn't a drama channel, so fuck off if you want that. I'll fight every Everyone who wants to <laughs> see you in the boxing ring. Why, why is it every single one of our videos seem to, at some point, involve us threatening to fight the audience? We, we should. Because when we finally do have a convention, I will literally.
literally body slam everyone we meet <laughs> just for a laugh. And I'm okay with it. I just hope the audience is. <laughs> you think you're sick, though, man? You will know about it when I fucking Batista bomb your nan in the middle of Asda and show an eggplant up a fanny, the fucking dustbag. But th- this this was literally the only credit to Daikon Film slash Gainax. This was all they had done as a, a team together. And then they managed to somehow convince a major studio, which as Rob pointed out, had only really done games at that point, to fund them to, I believe, I've, I've the source I have here gave them a budget of 800 million yen to create an original video animation. That must have been a hell of a pitch. Yeah, and you got to remember things like, for example, these guys went on to make some incredible stuff. As much as we might be shitting on them right now for being fucking... I don't even know what the right word to use here is. You've, you've got to be able to talk the talk and and spin a bit of a yarn and really sell up a project if you want to make anything in a professional setting. But the diff- I think the difference between any sort of two-bit fucking hustler in Hollywood or Tokyo making anime or making a film and saying it's going to be the next best thing, it's going to be amazing, you're going to make so much money from this. difference between a guy like that and someone like Yamaga on Okada is that they could back up what they were saying. These guys were incredibly talented creators with serious vision behind them. They weren't just bullshitting. They were bullshitting, but they had stuff to back their bullshit up. So basically, after they'd managed to blag their way into getting this massive budget, that is kind of how Gainax came together and what allowed them to uh, form as a studio. I think the original plan was they were just going to make this movie and then that was going to be it. They never really planned to like go on afterwards, but this is where they were able to bring on guys like Anno as the animator, where they were able to bring, I think, is it some of the other sort of major figures of this, like Yoshiyuki uh, Sadamoto, who did all the character designs. This th- look, Looking at the list of, I've, I've mentioned this a couple times, where if you look at an anime and you see like a bunch of animation directors, just that's usually a pretty good sign about you're gonna enjoy some really really well animated stuff but this one has let me see one two three there's four animation directors because it seems like they just kept bringing more people into it as it went on and like trying to hire more folk from outside of uh, they were putting adverts in like fan magazines and stuff like sending yeah. a pitch reel we we need more people to work yeah. on this because oh god we've bitten off more than we can fucking chew if i remember rightly it's broken up into is it three or four parts that they all animated so like I, if i remember rightly anno is the most involved with the last part that's why you see things like is it called Anno Shrapnel? Is that the term for it is? Where it's like Anno is notorious for you'll do an explosion and all the explosion, like all the material debris coming off it, it's all hand drawn by himself. And it looks beautiful, yeah, the Anno Shrapnel kind of effect. That that comes in in a big way in kind of the final scenes of it when the battle's yeah. going on and then the rocket launches and it is just Anno Shrapnel everywhere. That man knows how to make an explosion look fucking incredible. And they had to keep relocating studio space and stuff like that for like larger room. It's just so yeah, fucking... Yeah, because they, they... I think the problem with this production is it was so punk and put together and kind of making it up on the fly at points as well. Like They had a vision for what they wanted their film to be and what the message was going to be, but they didn't necessarily have a more firm grounding of the story and the characters. And that shows <laughs> there isn't a story. Yeah. Like. And and why it went through so many different sort of changes as well. Like there's the, the pilot film, which you, I get the impression, think that that was them doing another wee sneaky on, on the producers. I think Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I think it was partly that, but I also think it was them trying to sort of find a style and not it never quite meshing for them until the end. Well, I, well there's the whole thing where they were trying to trick Miyazaki for whatever reason. So they drew everything aping his house, his style. Me as actually was like, yeah. this is pretty good, but you're all a bunch of nerds. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically was his entire attitude as well. It's like, you guys don't know what the fuck you're doing, do you? But this is pretty cool. They, they did an entire pilot film basically in very Ghibli style. Like, if you look at the design for Raquini in particular, she's the most obvious change, because she looks completely fucking different to how she actually looks in the final film. Even Shiro, though, as well, he's drawn much younger and more youthful and handsome in the pilot film, and then the actual Shiro is, like, this slovenly piece of shit, basically. So, yeah, they, they did kind of pull the sneaky on you. On 
different people in order to keep people on board, which wound up biting them in the ass in a big way later on. Even just reading about like how they went about doing the, the production itself was really quite interesting because they didn't really have a, a traditional team structure within it. There wasn't like a bunch of guys at the top making the key decisions. It was a lot of back and forth between everyone in the project. So a lot of people were like offering their suggestions and having their say and then decisions were being made, which is a really, really cool way of doing it. But I think it's also the main reason why this project grew so many arms and legs and why it kind of expanded to a massive scope that they weren't necessarily prepared for. I, I know I always harp back to the prequels. A surprise, to be sure. But a welcome one. But I love to bring it up how just awful and plagued those productions were, right? They drew the drawing board to the story, right? Episode one is like Lucas had written this fucking tiny amount of how much script should episode one was. I I wrote it all in one draft. <laughs> it's like, now we're gonna film it. Whilst with this, it's the other way around. They drew all these cool, fantastic sequences. They're like, how the fuck do we string this together? <laughs> this is very much a, a production where it was world building and design first and story second. Let's move on to kind of the later stuff stages of the production, which is when the backers and the people who had ponied up the money started to realize that they weren't going to be getting another Gundam or another Yamato and kind of started to panic. Fucking outplayed. <laughs> yeah. Because again, as, as we've mentioned, uh, Yamaga and Okada had managed to pull a little sneaky and get a lot of people ponying up not a small amount of cash to make this project a reality. And they were doing this on the understanding that what they were getting was going to be... They, they basically wanted another Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. That was, that was yeah. the frame of reference that they had. That was the last really big animated hit in Japan. And they were like, we, we want that. And then the project started coming together and it wasn't just the pilot film that they used to pull a sneaky on them anymore and it was the actual final product and they were looking at it and going what the fuck is this? How are we going to get a sequel out of this? How are we going to get a franchise out of this? What the fuck is this? And Yamaga and Okada at this point are chuckling away to themselves because it's not like they hadn't basically delivered what they promised. It's just... Well, it's the fact that they'd sold it to them on merchandising rights and it's like, <laughs> name one thing you can merchandise in this film. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were expecting something very, very marketable and very, very mass appeal and what they got was was this very, very strange movie that was quite You gotta remember, one of the first press conferences, I think the, the guy who made the soundtrack was like, yeah, it's very much like Blade Runner. Is Blade Runner known to be a commercial success ever? <laughs> mm -hmm. No. <laughs> like basically with the amount of money that had been sunk into this project, it was going to have to be like the year's top 10 domestic box office release just to break even. Yep. And so they started doing some shady things to try and convince people that this was like the next Nausicaa when it really fucking wasn't. Like the posters they designed were super fucking misleading. They actually got like the primary character designer. There's like this one scene in the movie where this, there's this like this bug that Mana's playing with. It, it's technically in the movie, but they were like, okay, take that. I want you to then draw it as like a giant insect destroying the city that most of this takes place in. And Okada and Yamaga were getting really fucking annoyed about that because this was like crunch time when the movie was due to be coming out really soon. And they were like, why, why are you taking away one of our primary designers to make this dumb, misleading poster when he could be working on like polishing the movie? What the fuck are you guys doing? So there was, there was starting to be some tensions between backers and and financial supporters of the movie and the actual people creating it. And I think that's completely encapsulated in the actual title of the movie. I, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm only calling it Royal Space Force because that's what Gainax originally planned for it to be called. The extra title that they tacked on was because the backers were convinced that Royal Space Force was not sexy enough and was not going to bring in people. So they got their marketing guys to come up with uh, that extra title that it has, The Wings of Hanames, which doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but let me read some of the other alternate titles that these guys were suggesting, which I feel is definitive proof of why marketing people should never be allowed to decide anything ever. Right, right, I'll pretend I'm the test audience. Hit me up. <laughs> So instead of calling this uh, Royal Space Force, we are going to call this space.love 
dot story. Uh, no, we ain't doing that. Myth of passion. No, we ain't doing that. Young morning star Shirotsu. <laughs> Umawa Shinde. <laughs> Spirits of fire. Yeah, that's all right. Song of Icarus. I mean, that's actually pretty good. Parallel Zone 1987. I'd buy it, but I would think that has Jesse Ventura in it, and it was a B movie. <laughs> and Zero Vertex. What the fuck is a vertex not a corner? I don't. I don't fucking know, dude. They also wanted to call it the the wings of Requini as well, because they wanted to name it after a female character in it to make it more sexy. As you do. As you do. Basically, the marketing guys had no fucking idea what they were doing, and they were trying to turn a not Ghibli movie into a Ghibli movie. It didn't work. Just so we're clear for everyone, like just how bad this film was received commercially. Do you know what film it was? Uh, it was shown as a double feature, right? What's that? Well, I don't know if you'll have heard of this, but it's called Ewoks: The Battle for Endor. <laughs> That's what they featured it with because they were like, ain't nobody buying this. Which is a good way to lead into the fact that yeah, this this did not do well. In the box oh yeah, no. At all. Think, basically, they ran it forever because they were like, we gotta get the money back. And to be fair, Bandai did eventually make their money back off of it. It took them till like uh, 1994, I think. There we go. Bandai was reported as having made its money back on the movie in September of 1994, seven and a half years after its Japanese theatrical release. Now, let me continue to generate profit for them years to come. Because it's been re re-released numerous times. It's been, yeah. it's had a Western release now, as well as, I think it's been released by Manga Entertainment, as well as all the anime, which we keep repeating, because please sponsor us. Give us, give us anime, all the anime. I've read a couple of the interviews with some of the guys from Gainax who were sort of trying to defend it. It's like, it didn't do terribly. Their argument was it was never pulled from theatres, despite making <laughs> no money. That's not an argument for something being good. Coronation Street is still on the TV. <laughs> hey, hey, you do not talk shit about Cory. Uh, well, you know, you know who does talk shit? COVID-19. That <laughs> I, I guess what you you try and defend your thing, and to be fair, they made an art piece. It's never gonna it's never gonna fly that well in a mass sort of appeal kind of way. But it's yeah. like how people think. Like I I love the film Scanner Darkly, right? A great movie. It's a great movie. I get why I didn't make his money. <laughs> <laughs> but the net result of this, even though Bandai did make their money back eventually, seven years after the movie came out, Gainax was basically bankrupt by the end of it. They hadn't really been able to pay all their guys in a timely fashion so they had a lot of pissed off staff and people who worked with them a lot of the guys were really really burned out it, it was a complete disaster for them when this movie eventually did manage to release even though it was very well received critically so like that's why you have like Miyazaki coming out and saying yeah this was pretty fucking cool and other sort of pundits at the time were saying yeah this is really fucking cool it's just that you can't really make your money back off of Miyazaki saying you did good the main reason why Gainax didn't completely fold into bankruptcy at the time which they probably should have done is the who is it yeah this was this was Okada like he was kind of in charge of the studio and because he didn't really understand like the the proper business processes to pronounce the company dead and bankrupt they kind of just had to keep going so that's <laughs> the only reason why Gainax actually went on to do other Gainax stuff if they'd actually known that they could have just declared themselves bankrupt at that point they would have it's, it's one of those weird little eccentricities and twists of fate that allowed them to kind of carry on because they didn't realize that they had a choice not to, but that's where a lot of their other productions eventually came from. But yeah, that's that's a, a long look at the, the production of it. Holy shit, we've been recording for an hour already and we've only covered some of it. Dad. This is gonna <laughs> be a long edit. Uh, Joke's on Dave. I regret everything. Let's actually try and review this thing now, because this is ostensibly a review. Oh, God. Let's talk about the positives of this, Robert. Tell me about what you think the positives are. The animation. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot else to talk about. I mean, I like the soundtrack, but that's my own great. particular love of the soundtrack. Holy fuck. I, I could, there, there are certain scenes within this movie. I, I don't normally do this when I'm watching something for this channel. Like, normally I'm trying to just power through it. Whereas with this, there were several key scenes throughout it where I watched it, paused, rewound back to the start of that scene and watched it again because it just was that good and it was that great to watch. It's like, I, I need to see that again. Not not because I have to, because I, f I fucking want to. Like the sequence where Shiro's taken up for like zero gravity training in that plane. Holy fuck. <laughs> How did they do that? They, they have like dynamic plane movements and dynamic camera movements all within the same shot. Like the camera's floating around the aircraft as it's 
moving. It's incredible. The honest answer here is they actually did use very early CG and it's just not noticeable. <laughs> like, that had never been done before. No, this is like one of the first examples of CGI being used to animate a sequence that was considered too difficult to animate. This wasn't done with like the computers of the time. This was done on someone's PC. Like, yeah. <laughs> they used ASCII in parts of the animation of this film, David. The sequence that we've, we kind of touched on earlier, like Anno's clear influence is showing with it is, is the sequence with the rocket being launched as this battle begins to unfold between two nations. God damn, that looks really fucking good. Again, all the Anno shrapnel and these these tanks going off against one another, the aircraft dogfighting above as this rocket is being launched. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> like, yeah, it, it's straight up, this is a beautiful movie. I think that's the perfect description. Like, I, I think that word is overused a lot of the time, but this is, this is beautiful. Another thing that I really, really appreciated about it is the, the amount of effort and time they poured into building this world that was completely different to ours, but also very, very familiar, which was kind of a key design philosophy that Yamaga had from the start. He wanted something that was different but familiar to kind of remind people of reality and make them think about it in a different way. So it feels like a real breathing, living city. Like, you know, some fantasy or some sci-fi, you look at the concepts that they have and it feels very stilted. It doesn't seem like a world that people would actually live in, whereas this feels completely grounded, but also completely different to how we do things. Like down to, they changed the design of money. They changed the fucking design of money. I don't know why they did it, but it's brilliant. And it makes no sense, but it also makes complete sense as well. And it, it makes you sort of reassess everything within it. Like from the designs of the cars, to the streets, to the clothes that people wear, they wanted to build a world from the ground up and they managed to do it. And that's not easy to do. But when you pull it off, you do create something quite magical. You make this actual world that people feel like they're kind of exploring and living in. Yeah, it's just all these like little things. And that's why I fully get Miyazaki's complaint about the rocket just being like, here's the Soviet rocket. So it's like you put all this thought and intelligence into everything else to do with the film and you've let yourself down. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like a really straight... I guess they wanted to make that seem very, very realistic. That that was... I think that was Yamaga's defense of their decision there as to why they made it so similar to our own world with that one design choice. But I feel that was an absolute missed opportunity because these guys made cylindrical money. I want to see what they come up with for a fucking rocket design. I want to see what they imagined with that, but I, we we never get to see that and that seems like such a, a waste of a, a, a chance I think Miyazaki's he kind of gave two criticisms of this particular project the first one which you mentioned about the like the rocket designs but his second criticism is that uh, basically in the, the dramatic finale of this movie war is broken out around the, the rocket launch site and so they're told to abort its launch basically everyone within the project right as they're about to like succeed are being told now you can't anymore and they're already to pack it up and it takes uh, Shiro giving them this heartfelt speech from the, the cockpit of the rocket to make them agree to launch. My argument here with this is I think Miyazaki is wrong but I get where Miyazaki is coming from. Miyazaki's heroes are usually trying to stop something bad occurring. So like in Princess Mononoke. Right, so you know how he's trying to convince everyone to not shoot the forest spirits because that's bad. Every single <laughs> one of Miyazaki's early movies is like an environmentalist piece. Yeah. So like in Miyazaki's films the protagonist is the person who's trying to defeat the bureaucracy of unwillingness to change. So like, if this was a Miyazaki film, the hero would not necessarily be trying to cancel the launch. The launch would have some kind of flaw and he would offer them to cancel it, fix the flaw, and then launch again with the flaw fixed, right? So like, Miyazaki's complaint that, oh, they wouldn't just cancel it, they've spent years designing this. It's like, yeah, but every one of your films, <laughs> that's how you write it. <laughs> I also think that he's relating more to like the old guys who have sunk all of their time into creating this rocket. That's who he's relating to. Whereas what the story was calling for is Shiro having this change of character and actually growing into someone who wasn't a total piece of shit. So they needed him to have this kind of cathartic moment where he's making a decision that puts himself at risk, but it's for a, a greater cause because throughout this movie, he'd been a selfish asshole. And so they had to show his character change in a very dramatic moment. And so that's why I think they did that, which I, th I think works. So I don't, I don't entirely agree with Miyazaki's criticism there, though I 
I do see where he's coming from. There's a couple other elements that they try and introduce into the the film. Like there's a running theme at certain points in the movie where characters are pointing out why are we building this rocket and why are we sinking all of this money into this mad project that will probably never succeed when there are all of these like starving people within the city, all of these poor and homeless people within the city. Why why are we doing this? Is this the right decision? And it's like that's a, that's a really interesting question. I wonder how the movie's going to answer it. And they don't. <laughs> they just don't. Yeah. They just they just let that slide under the rug. You have some issues with the story. I was oh, there just isn't one. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the plot of the film is this country wants to send a rocket into space. That is addressed in like the first four minutes, five, ten minutes maybe, and then the rest of the plot there isn't one. <laughs> yeah, there's there's events that happen in this movie, but they're not. There's really neat animation sequences in this movie with no plot to string it together. It's like if you took away all the plot of the Kira, Kira is still a beautiful film, but <laughs> but it has all the plot to back it up as well exactly whereas this has I think it's maybe an issue with the characters that they hang it on like you need strong characters to drive a plot forward and I think that that's clearly something that they'd overlooked in their design like going back to what we were saying at the start when they first pitched this movie they had an idea for the story and they had an idea of the themes they did not have any idea who the characters were going to be you need characters because they are the guys who drive the plot without them you have cool events and then nothing to really string that together so and oh god I don't want to talk about this because this is a can of worms that we are about to kick, my dude. But let's talk about that particular scene with Shiro and Raquini. Oh, I honestly think discussion of this is not necessarily to the betterment of Japan. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is what it is. It is a sexual assault scene depicted in animation. There are going to be strong views on this either way. My complaints about the plot, right, is because there isn't any plot. And a scene like this is thrown in to create the perception of a plot that there will be some kind of development of the character. But it's literally just thrown in there for no reason. <laughs> like, as far as I can get it, it doesn't advance any characters. It doesn't show anything of any of the characters because you've not actually seen that side of the character. It's clearly an idea they had that they've put in and never came back to. <laughs> Using a something as serious as sexual assault or just any sort of ballpark, that kind of bad shit in a piece of media is an inherently risky thing to do. You have to handle it so fucking carefully. So like, you know, all those kind of things were like the positives of the scene outweigh the negative of what you're showing. You can't really have a character do something like that and then try and run it back a bit. Like that, that's that's something that will create such strong feelings within the audience that yeah, you you are crossing the Rubicon with that move. Like you, you there's no going back from there if he pulls something like that. I don't know. I can sort of see what they were trying to do, but like like I said, you've got to be so careful with with something like this. And I don't know if they were maybe careful enough. But I think what they were trying to do was again it goes back to that whole positive depiction of religion particularly Christianity because they don't call it Christianity the thing that Requini's into but it's clearly Christianity inspired a lot of people take issue with it because like Shiro obviously he attempts to sexually assault her let's call it what it is she clocks him over the head with a fucking religious ornament and he gets knocked out in the morning he attempts to apologize to her and she actually turned around to him and said no I'm sorry I, I shouldn't have hit you that was just awful and I've read some people online being fucking furious with that particular moment like they're saying oh she's such a pushover it's it shows certain attitudes that the writers had about women and things like that i didn't read it that way what i saw there was an absolutely archetypical example of a uh, christian doing the whole turning the other cheek thing she's not offering him forgiveness she's not offering him anything she's just turning it aside and leaving all of the blame and all of the guilt on shiro yeah. and that's a very powerful thing to do but again I don't think it was done well enough to justify the use of something like sexual assault because again you've got to be so careful when you use something like that because it is going to invoke such strong feelings from the audience that you've got to know what you're doing and I don't think they did I don't disagree with that I do think there are I use the prime example and that is Twin Peaks I think of this style of scene where it's it's not shown it's not depicted it's done in a way to horrify the viewer for the continuation of the plot <laughs> this scene if it wasn't in the film changes nothing. Or they could have done it in just a slightly different way and it still would have had the same effect. Whereas I think personally, if you remove that scene from the film, nothing changes. If you get what yeah. I mean. Like if you were to yeah. just cut that scene 
out of the film what actually changes not enough to justify using something like that it's one of the reasons why I, I felt we did have to to address it here it's one of those scenes that you see people bring it up and it's obviously it's kind of stained their enjoyment of Royal Space Force a little bit it's like oh yeah it's an amazing film apart from that one scene or like it's one scene away from being a perfect movie and yeah I, I get where you guys are coming from it could have been done so much better if, if they were going to do that at all and if you can't do it well just don't do a scene like that because you're going to upset a lot of people. Very bad. <laughs> Why would you say something so controversial and yet so brave? So let's let's try and wrap things up. Robert, please give me some parting thoughts on Royal Space Force. I'm not calling it by its stupid fucking second name. Go watch it. <laughs> like, go watch it for its animation. Don't go in expecting any story. This is... It's like a studio showreel is the way to describe this. This was like their... That's a really good way of describing like, it. Like, this is them showing off what they can do, what they were planning to do, what they intended to do going forward as a studio. And guess what they did? They did that. <laughs> they just added in a plot. <laughs> That's the thing they changed. Without this film, there's no Ava, there's no Anno, there's no Gunbuster, there's no... Yeah, some of, some of the most influential series and films and, and productions within anime would not exist if all of these guys hadn't hadn't managed to like blag their way into creating this movie. So you wouldn't have Trigger, you, you wouldn't yeah. have all of the things that Evangelion has influenced over the years. It, it would be a completely different scene within the anime industry. You don't have, for example, the whole fucking bouncing tits in anime. Like, and I mean yeah. that. That comes from Gainax. Like, yeah, that, that was that was Anno. Thank you, Anno. It, it's something that's worth watching just for like a piece of anime history. Like this was was a absolute trailblazer of a film that kind of spearheaded the idea of original video animations and bringing in new talent and younger creators because they have very very different ways of approaching it that could potentially become very very bankable. This one wasn't, as we've explained, but the guys who made this went on to create some incredible stuff so if you kind of want to see where they got their start and what they were doing initially before they went on to make some of these things yeah check 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 this one out we're monetized now by the way dude we we oh shit does that mean we can't swear anymore <laughs> uh i think it fucking does yeah fuck fuck <laughs> fuck we have made 33 pence since monetization got turned on that's dude. two flumps <laughs> that's what two flumps you know the marshmallow bar things <laughs> what the fuck are you spending your money on dude jesus flumps Christ. i just told you <laughs> they're 15 pence each what are you on about it. Sort your life out, man. Jesus Christ, are you okay? You can get an 80 pack off of Amazon for 15 quid. There you go. Maybe we'll be able to afford that in like three years. That will be what we spend the channel money on. I'm okay with this. Buy an entire box of flumps and then just delete the entire channel. That that will be that will be our magnum opus. We'll have achieved their goal. That's only 40 flumps between us. That's that's Oh, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with that. That's that's cool. <laughs> Thank you.